So um, we're, uh, we're delighted to be here. Moving into the 20th century today, um, and uh, let's start with a specific date. Late afternoon, September 28th, 1918. A lone aircraft appeared over an American airfield in France. Get my slides going here. Montgomery native, here he is, Penrose Stout was at the controls. He had departed a few minutes earlier, and his ground crew did not expect him back so soon. He made a smooth landing and climbed out of the cockpit. He took a few steps and then collapsed from wounds inflicted by five German aircraft that had surprised him shortly after takeoff. Stout was a member of the 27th Aero Squadron, one of four squadrons that made up the first pursuit group. As a combat pilot, Stout was part of a select cadre. Approximately 50,000 American men applied to train as pilots in the Great War. About 1,400 saw combat. In some ways, Stout was typical of American pilots during the war. He was college educated, white, and, professional, and, a, and a professional. But he was unlike many of his comrades in several important ways. First, he was 31 years old, substantially older than most other pilots whose average age was about 20. In fact, he was older than Eddie Rickenbacker, who, who was considered well advanced uh, when he started flight training at age 28. Second, he was a Southerner who had migrated to the North for economic opportunity. Third, he left a well-established career to volunteer for the Air Service. Fourth, he was a talented artist who documented his service and his impressions of France with his drawings. Finally, he flew with one of the most successful and elite American air units of World War I, the first pursuit group. It included such famous pilots as Eddie Rickenbacker and Frank Luke, both recipients of the Medal of Honor. Stout's combat duty lasted scarcely a month, and he did not down any, any enemy aircraft. Nevertheless, his story offers important insights into the experiences of America's first combat pilots. His letters home contain descriptions of daily routines, accounts of combat missions, his impressions of France, and much, much more. As important as the words of his letters are the numerous sketches he scattered throughout his correspondence. In addition, he compiled a sketchbook that uh, documents his military service. Because of his background as a professional architect and skilled artist, Stout found the French landscape and its architecture compelling. His deep appreciation of the beauty of France found its way into his letters and drawings. Fortunately, Stout's family recognized the value of his wartime letters and artwork. As Steve mentioned, uh, they preserved them over the decades and they recently donated them to the department here. Stout was the eldest son of Robert Platt Stout of Montgomery and Zimula Vass of Mobile. He was born February 28, 1887. Penn, as he was known to family and friends, was named for his maternal grandfather, Horatio Penrose Vass, who was born in Maryland and migrated to Mobile. The Stout family lived in Montgomery. Penn's father was a cotton broker, and he earned a modest income. He died suddenly while Penn was a teenager, leaving his widow responsible for a household of three children and several extended family members. Despite this difficult financial situation, Stout completed high school and went on to college at Alabama Polytechnic Institute, which is, of course, now Auburn University. Perhaps his earliest, the earliest surviving example of Stout's artistic talent, talent appears in the Auburn Yearbook. Over a half dozen of his sketches appear in the 1905 edition. Oops, get a quick trigger finger here. He apparently entered Auburn in 1905 as a sophomore, majoring in civil engineering. Like all male students at Auburn of that era, he was a member of the Corps of Cadets. He excelled and rose to the rank of cadet lieutenant. His, he was a brother in Alpha Tau Omega fraternity, president of the German club, and secretary of his senior class. The description with his senior photograph in the yearbook describes him as the best artist in the school. In 1907, he completed his degree in civil engineering, but remained at Auburn and entered the new program in architecture. He was in the first class of five and also served as an architecture instructor. 
In 1909, he completed a second bachelor's degree, this time in architecture. Details of Stout's life for eight years after he left Auburn are sketchy. He worked as an architect in Pensacola and remained there at least until 1912. Sometime before early 1917, he moved to Bronxville, New York, a wealthy suburb of New York City. The move was apparently at the behest of his cousins Frank and Kate Chambers, who treated Stout like a foster son. The Chambers had left Alabama and settled in Bronxville in the 1880s, and they emerged as prominent and influential members of that community. Thus, when he entered, uh, when the U.S. entered World War I in April of 1917, Stout was 30 years old and a practicing architect in New York. After the U.S. declared war, Stout applied for duty with the Air Service and hoped to become a pursuit pilot. The Army rejected him, perhaps because of his age. He did not abandon his goal of becoming a, a pursuit pilot, but he was determined to serve in the war in some capacity. Consequently, he volunteered for officer candidate school at Plattsburgh, New York, and began training on May 12, 1917. Two of Stout's letters while he was an officer candidate at Plattsburgh have survived. Both contain sketches illustrating the text of the letters, and this was a habit he maintained throughout his correspondence during the war. Often humorous, the sketches enhanced the descriptions of the letters. In a letter to his cousin Kate Chambers, Stout included three sketches. The first shows signal flag training. The second, a sunset over the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains. And the third is a self-portrait of Stout writing in his bunk, writing letters with the caption written thus. A letter to his cousin Frank Chambers contains a humor sketch showing an officer candidate carrying gear, carrying his gear after he received orders on, a short, on short notice to move to another barracks. These four sketches are examples of the four types of illustrations in Stout's letters home, details of training, compelling scenes, daily life, and humorous situations. His sense of humor extended to, to the photographic record as well. Here's a photo of Stout at Plattsburgh, <laughs> obviously not taking himself too seriously. <laughs> While at Plattsburgh, Stout continued his efforts to join the Air Service. He took the physical exam and failed the hearing test. He took it again and he passed. Afraid that he still not, might not make the cut due to his advanced age, he requested a letter of recommendation from Auburn President Charles Thatch. He reported to his cousin Frank that, I received a corking reply. Uh, in the jargon of the 19, early 19th century, I, I assumed that to mean it was a really good reply. <laughs> Stout's persistence paid off. He was finally selected for aviation training and left Plattsburgh without completing the course. On July 21st, 1917, he entered training at the U.S. School of Military Aeronautics at Princeton University. And here's a portrait of him that probably dates from his time as a cadet at Princeton. To enter aviation training, he abandoned officer candidate school at Plattsburgh after 10 weeks and only three weeks away from receiving his commission as a second lieutenant, a clear sign of his passion to serve as a pilot. His transfer to the Air Service meant that he started again from the bottom as an aviation cadet. As it turned out, the move delayed his commissioning by six months. The school at Princeton was one of eight at various universities across the nation. These programs provided ground training for cadets, the first of three phases of training for Army pilots. In the second and third phases, primary and advanced, aviation cadets would actually take to the air and learn to fly. The system of training did not exist before the United States entered the war. In April 1917, the resources of the Army's aviation section were rudimentary at best, and establishing ground schools at universities was part of the effort to expand pilot training quickly. Stout performed well at Princeton. The officer in command of the school appointed him cadet commander midway through the course in charge of all the students at the school. His maturity and his earlier training at Auburn and Plattsburgh made him an obvious choice for this responsibility. In a letter to his mother, Stout reported that during a meal, two cadets got into a fight, and I'm quoting from his letter, two cadets, quote, got into a fight and I had to dive across the hall and separate them. One of them seemed very grateful to me. 
I made them shake hands and make up, and they sat down together and were just as pleasant and affable during the rest of the meal as two game roosters. <laughs> and to emphasize that last bit of sarcasm, Stout included a sketch of the two combatants dining after the fight. <laughs> As he neared completion of ground school at Princeton in mid-September, the uncertainty of the next phase of training weighed on Stout's mind. He told his cousin Kate that, quote, all the foreign schools are full, and although the U.S. flying fields are ready, we can't get the airplanes for training. The manufacturers have almost all fallen down on their contracts, so it looks as if the chances for my getting abroad are growing slimmer each day. And Stout's act information was indeed accurate. Despite an ambitious goal of producing 22,000 planes in the first year of the war, production rates lagged substantially. To compensate for the delay, the Air Service developed plans to train cadets in France, Britain, and Italy using their airplanes and their instructors, by the way. By far, the largest operation in was in France, which by the end of the war was home to the largest flight training facility in the world. Stout's fears that he might never leave U.S. shores for duty in Europe were in unfounded. On September 25th, 1917, he was aboard a ship steaming for an unknown destination. He told his mother that he was, quote, very happy to be on his way. He guessed that he was f headed for France to, quote, finish up my training there in the flying school and then on to active service. In a letter written on his transatlantic crossing, Stout indulged his wry sense of humor. He wrote, realizing your fondness for drawings and things artistic, I shall draw you a panoramic view of the port side of the ship. <laughs> and he continued, and this is the view from the starboard side. Stout disembarked in Great Britain. He spent several days there seeing the sights and awaiting transportation to France. Once on the continent, he had a few days to enjoy the landmarks in and around Paris. He described his visit to Notre Dame Cathedral as, quote, one of the most impressive occasions of my life. His excursion to Versailles Palace prompted this exclamation, Lord, what a place, what architecture, what trees and vistas. The Petit Trianon is superb, and I felt like walking right up to the little farm buildings and shaking hands with him, with them. One Paris landmark, however, failed to impress him. He wrote, I don't give a rip about the Eiffel Tower, but I wanted to see it and count it in the high buildings I have spit off of. <laughs> Sightseeing ended when Stout took a train to an encampment in the French countryside and waited for the next phase of training. He wrote his family, quote, passing through this lovely country, it is easy to see why the French fight like demons. The camp was a holding area and he stayed there for several weeks. Finally, as he gleefully reported in a letter home, quote, orders arrived for us to report to a certain camp for instructions in flying. At last, praise Allah, unquote. Although Stout does not name the site, he began primary flight training at Tour Aerodrome. He had reached an important milestone and devoted the first page of his sketchbook to an illustration of the hangar at Tour. Tour Aerodrome, about 150 uh, miles southwest of Paris, was a complex of, complex of airfields that provided the first phase of flight training for several thousand American cadets during the war. Originally a French training facility, it was the site of the Second Air Instruction Center, American Expeditionary Forces. The first class of air service trainees arrived in mid-August. The French retained control of the field for most of the war and provided the instructors for the American cadets. By November, Stout was deep in his training at Tours. Almost all of the instructors were French, and they spoke little or no English. Stout provided his family with a colorful description of his first flight, complete with a sketch. On the first day of instruction, Stout did not understand that he was expected to go to the instructor, uh, go with his instructor to the flying field. He wrote. When I arrived at the field, Monsieur Fouche was waiting and proceeded to bawl me out in French, part of which I grasped. <laughs> then he ordered me in. 
The mechanic gave the propeller a spin, a wild whir, and a terrible win. The machine quivered and shook and started bumping across the field at a terrific rate, faster and faster, and then a sensation of wonderful smoothness as we lifted into the air. And then the fun commenced. He proceeded to punish me for not being there to ride over with him. We would glide along smoothly, then drop a few hundred feet like a rocket, rocking from side to side. Every now and then he would turn around, look at me, and I tried to grin back to make him believe that I was enjoying the rough stuff. After what seemed like an hour, we made a final dive for Earth, and I was informed that I had been up about 12 minutes. <laughs> After several weeks of dual instruction and training delays due to bad weather, Stout soloed. He described the experience to his family in somber detail. Then the great day arrived, one of the greatest in an aviator's career, the day when he makes his first hop. You are to get up in the air, fly a few hundred yards in a straight line, and land all by yourself. Sounds very simple, but it's not. You are given a great deal of urgent, friendly advice by your friends who, make sh who you feel sure have already started wondering who will get your best sweater and muffler. Some of your friends insist on solemnly shaking your hand and assure you that you will make it all right. Well, I got by with it all right and there is reason to feel good about it when three of, out of our class of six smashed their machines. After he soloed, the training was slow because of dismal winter weather. On the days he was grounded, Stout made an excursion in, in, into the countryside he had come to love, and its beauty overwhelmed him. He wrote home, the roads are perfect, the scenery, the houses, cottages, and trees, whoops la la. And he treated his family to this sketch of a wine cellar carved into the side of a cliff. Shortly after Christmas, he suffered another delay when a wisdom tooth required extraction and several days in the hospital. And after he recovered from his dental work, another delay. An outbreak of spinal meningitis required a quarantine of the cadets. All told, he lost at least six weeks of training to his dental problems in the quarantine. By March 1918, Stout had finished primary training at Tours. He was commissioned a first lieutenant and he received his wings. He took pride in his wings and in his typical fashion, he's provided a sketch in a letter. His next stop was at the third aviation instruction center at Issoudun, another French field. Training at Issoudun provided, quote, a complete course in advanced flying and in aerial tactics, as he told his family. Moving to the next phase of training improved Stout's morale considerably. He told his cousin Kate, I love this life and the training is wonderfully interesting. His sketchbook contains this depiction of an evening in the barracks at Issoudun. By April 1918, Stout was well into his advanced training. In a letter home, he remarked that, quote, when I first made application for duty as a pilot, somewhat over a year ago, I would have been astonished to hear that it would take half so long to qualify for combat duty. It is aggravating when big things are happening out on the front and we know that we are needed. In May, Stout temporarily, temporarily left Isuda for gunnery training at Cazo, a French base on, on the western coast of southern France. While at Cazo, he met a young French woman for whom, he wrote his mother, I took a complete tumble. He spent his leisure time at Cazo with her sailing, horseback riding, and swimming. Despite his infatuation, he still found time to draw. One can imagine him making this sketch while relaxing with his mademoiselle. He also made several sketches of operations at the gunnery school. After finishing at Cazo, he returned to Isoduff to complete his advanced training. By mid-June 1918, he had finished, but did not proceed directly to the front. Instead, he was assigned to the Air Service Acceptance Park at Orly Aerodrome outside of Paris. His primary duty was to ferry new aircraft to bases throughout France. Pilots usually spent several months on ferry duty while awaiting orders to a combat unit. While at Orly, Stout found time to visit Paris, and his ferry missions took him to new, new look locales in France. Several of the drawings in his sketchbook probably date from his time as a ferry pilot. 
For example, here is an illustration of a cafe scene in Paris. And here are two drawings of the French landscape that Stout may have encountered while on ferry duty. Stout also drew portraits of people he encountered. Here are two French subjects that may have caught his eye. In early July, on a ferry mission to the front, Stout encountered his brother-in-law, Jack Hoover, a pilot with the 27th Squadron. And here's a sketch he drew of, of Hoover. Um, <clears throat> Hoover invited Stout to visit his unit, and he introduced him to the commander, Major Harold Hartney. He apparently impressed Hartney, who said he intended to request Stout's immediate transfer to the 27th. Stout was ext ecstatic. Unfortunately, he encountered another delay. The day after he visited the 27th, he was on another ferry mission and crashed the aircraft on landing. He was not injured, but the aircraft was a total loss. The commander of the ferry unit punished Stout for his error by extending his ferry duty from two months to three. His, this turn of events devastated him and his morale plummeted. Finally, at the end of August, Stout received orders to the front. He told his mother the news in a short illustrated note that showed an empty jail cell. I am at last a free man, and I am very happy over the prospects of being sent to the front in a few days. I shall probably join Jack's squadron. Stout's orders directed him to the first pursuit group for combat duty. When he reported at the end of August, he found that Major Hartney had been promoted to group commander. But he remembered that Stout wanted to serve in the same unit as his brother-in-law, and he assigned him to the 27th Squadron. As a new pilot in the 27th, Stout encountered hazing from the experienced members of the unit. In one of his letters, he noted that, quote, joining the squadron reminded me of Auburn and the fraternity rushes. The similarity was not accidental. In his memoirs, Major Hartney commented that joining a combat squadron was indeed like joining a fraternity. The goal, Hartney explained, was, quote, to have officers live closely together and associate closely at all times and to instill a sort of single mind unity in, into the entire group on the ground and in the air with a smooth chain of responsibility from the top down to the newest officers. Stout took it all in, star, in stride. He found his squadron mates, quote, a most congenial, fine-spirited bunch. Ironically, the most famous and successful of Stout's squadron mates was Frank Luke, a maverick pilot who did not find the fraternity atmosphere of a combat squadron at all congenial. In his brief but spectacular career with the 27th, Luke downed four German aircraft and 14 German balloons in only three weeks, a feat that earned him a posthumous Medal of Honor. Eddie, Rickenbach, Eddie Rickenbacker declared him, quote, the greatest fighting pilot of the war. Now, Stout and Luke were polar opposites. Luke was a youngster, only 21 years old. He was from Arizona and had not attended college. He earned his wings and commission in the United States, completed combat training at Issoudun, and joined the 27th in late July. Unlike Stout, he was a loner and not a team player. In one letter, Stout described a September 15th mission with a pilot he called the Boob, but who was no doubt Frank Luke. It was an afternoon patrol led by his brother-in-law. It was a mission, Stout said, which I shall not soon forget. Here is his description of the episode. We were sent up on a mission to protect one of our boys while he went down and got a Hun balloon. It was understood that the boob, uh, by the boob, that he, he was not to leave the, the formation unless he was given the signal. The signal wasn't given for there sitting up in the sky, a thousand meters above us were nine hungry Huns and there were only six of us. The boob left without the signal. About this time, another one of the men had motor trouble and had to leave. That left four of us sitting right up under the Huns in easy meat. Jack's maneuvering was splendid, and although we had to stick around to see that the boob wasn't picked off while he bagged his balloon, Jack maneuvered so as to make as difficult a target as possible. Jack says it was the most precarious predicament in which he has ever been placed. And what he told the boob when he came down, well... 
Less than a week later, Stout revised his opinion of Luke, and he recounted Luke's daring exploits in another letter that included this sketch of the young pilot. For the first for, for his first month in the 27th, Stout noted, Luke was, quote, very unpopular. But in recent days, he continued, Luke had downed a number of German observation balloons, a feat that finally earned him some respect. Stout explained the hazards of attacking balloons. Now, balloon strafing, he said, is a perilous job. They are located quite a distance behind the lines and are protected by enemy aircraft, anti-aircraft guns, machine guns, and enemy machines constantly on alert for such attacks, and they can quite easily dive down from their altitude and pick you off. Despite the danger, Stout noted, Luke had brought down seven balloons in the past week. Such unprecedented success, Stout admitted, quote, takes a great quantity of unmitigated nerve, and Luke has done it, and my hat's off to him, and likewise all the other chapeau in the outfit. Eight days later, Luke had 18 victories to his credit and went missing in combat. His remains were later discovered in a French village. In, a, in addition to the sketch in his letter, Stout drew a larger, more detailed portrait of Frank Luke. Stout wrote his last letter from the front on September 26, 1918, a day and a year after he left New York. What a memorable year, he declared to his mother. The waiting, the training, the fighting, even the hardships of last winter's cadet life seem interesting, and I am thankful for it. September 26, 1918, also marked the beginning of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, the largest and bloodiest battle in American history. It was the final decisive campaign of the war. Stout's letter on that day contains a vivid description of the scene after his pre-dawn takeoff. I shall never, as long as I live, forget that sight in the early morning mist. Hundreds of flashes from woods, from shell craters, and from beneath the fog. There were white flashes, yellow flashes, blue ones, and columns of smoke rising, signal star clusters, white archie, black archie. Archie is anti-aircraft artillery, it's a slang word for it. The image was so fixed in Stout's mind that he captured it in this drawing. The scene from the air at the onset of the Meuse-Argonne offensive likewise left deep and lasting memories in the minds of many other airmen. For example, Eddie Rickenbacker described what he saw immediately after takeoff 30 minutes before dawn. Though the, uh, through the darkness, the whole western horizon was illumined with one mass of sudden flashes. The big guns were belching out their shells with such rapidity that there appeared to be millions of them shooting at the same time. Looking back, I saw the same scene in my rear. There was not one spot of darkness along the whole front. The opening artillery barrage Stout and his comrades witnessed was indeed unprecedented. According to one source, in the three hours preceding the American attack that morning, the Allies expended more ammunition than both sides fired throughout the four years of the U.S. Civil War. It was a horrifyingly spectacular display, and Stout's drawing may well be the only aerial image of the scene that exists. If so, it is arguably the most significant drawing he made during the war. Two days into the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, Stout's combat service came to an abrupt end. And now, to return to the story with which I began. On the afternoon of September 28th, Stout taxied his SPAD to the runway with his squadron mates for, for a patrol mission. And here's the uh, a photograph of the type of airplane he was flying. Just before takeoff, Stout had a mechanical problem, and the rest of his patrol departed without him. His ground crew fixed the problem, and 20 minutes later he was in the air, hoping to join his comrades. Shortly after he departed, five German aircraft attacked him from above. To give you an idea of the situation, here's a painting. Unfortunately, it's not Stout's, but a painting to give you an idea of the situation. His brother-in-law, Jack Hoover, reported that Stout remained, quote, cool-headed, and he showed great skill in evading his attackers and managed to escape despite overwhelming odds. He returned to his home base, base executed that smooth landing, 
He climbed out of his sped, took a few steps, and collapsed. Hoover called it, quote, one of the nerviest and pluckiest pieces of flying I have ever seen or heard of. Stout was immediately evacuated to a field hospital. A German round had penetrated his shoulder and exited his chest. He was extremely lucky. The bullet was an explosive round, but it detonated after it left his body. Consequently, he fully recovered from his wounds, but not before the armistice of November 11th, 1918. He had flown his last mission. For his exploits, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. During his convalescence, he moved to various hospitals in France. By early December, he found himself on the French Riviera in the town of Yer. He reported to his family that he was, quote, living a dreamy, dreamlike existence in this fairy land with the sole object of amusing ourselves. Uncle Sam has left nothing to wish for in providing for the convalescent officers here. The San Salvador is w one of the most sumptuous hotels along the Riviera. And the hotel was indeed a pleasant site for recovering officers, judging from Stout's description. He wrote, a beautiful chateau was built here some 40 years ago, and the hotel was added to this only a few years before the war. The grounds were extensively enlarged and planted, and even now in the middle of December, there is an effusion of brilliant flowers. He continued his description for several paragraphs, describing his room, the appointments of the hotel, the luxury of hot and cold running water, and the sus suspension of sis uh, censorship rules after the um, armistice allowed him to name his location, and he also included this hand-drawn map in his letter of his location. During his time on the Riviera, Stout made several ex excursions to see the sites in the vicinity. And this drawing of the Saint Jean Fortress in the harbor at Marseille <clears throat> may date from his convalescence on the Riviera. Stout remained in France until January 1919. He wrote a comrade on the day of his departure, and he did not fail to in include a sketch that illustrated his upcoming voyage home. His photograph and, his, and, and accounts of his ex exploits appeared in several New York newspapers. Penrose vast Stout overcame considerable odds to, to achieve his goal of flying in combat. After his return home, he resumed his architectural career. I found no evidence that he ever flew again or returned to France. In 1921, he married Lucia Meggs, who was some 12 years his junior. She came from a prominent Bronxville family and was the granddaughter of William Van Duzer Lawrence, the founder of Sarah Lawrence College. Stout and his wife started a family, and he established a thriving architectural practice with an office in New York City. The onset of the Great Depression brought hardship to the Stout family as clients dwindled. And on October 25, 1934, at the age of 47, he died suddenly of a heart attack. His obituary in the New York Times noted his service in the war. His last commission was for the Alumni House at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Here is the building he designed that was constructed after his death. And there you have it, the story of Penn's improbable journey from obscure beginnings in Montgomery to combat in the skies over France. Thank you.